Well, as we continue on to verse 2 of chapter 3 of Titus, we find that uh, Paul is really transitioning in his commentary here. He's telling us, first of all, that we should be good citizens. We That whatever is a good thing to do, we should do that, which also means being a good citizen means we refuse to do things that God says aren't good. And that's where a lot of people get in trouble. It's called civil disobedience. But it's kind of like when I was growing up in the 60s. I mean, America, I would agree with people when they said America was systemically racist. Uh, I know that even though I grew up in California and I had people in my community of every race, there was a distinct prejudice against people who are of African-American descent. And my parents were bigots. I mean, uh, and I remember even as a kid, especially listening to, for the first time to people like Martin Luther King, it became really clear to me that this was wrong. And I remember having these arguments with my parents that racism was wrong. In fact, pointing out to them that they were racist and and they would tell me they weren't. And, and my dad had a great statement. He said, some of my best friends are Negroes. And I said, really? I've never met any of them. Who would that be? And then he would ma uh, mention some officer uh, at the base who was a doctor there that I was familiar with, but he had never been in our home. I'd never seen my dad in any kind of conversation with him. And I know that by my, the way my dad talked about African Americans, that he was prejudiced. I mean, his, his mom came from Alabama. So, I mean, it was something that was pretty rooted in him pretty deeply. And so, you know, it was one of those things that when our government began to say it's wrong to treat people inequitably and unfairly, uh, you know, it, it's really easy for me to see the, the goodness of that argument and to see that this segregationist uh, attitude and the separation and this really kind of hateful prejudice was wrong and, and should be changed. So it was really easy for me to, to go out and, and demonstrate and, and, and support the idea of civil rights and all the rest of that. But the other side of it is, he said, but when there is things that are wrong, you need to be careful in how you talk about them. Because the first thing he says is to slander no one. And, and slander means to speak evil of a person in order to diminish uh, that person's view of that other person. And that's really, that's really a challenging sometimes because sometimes you need to talk to people about someone or something in a way that helps them to be careful and be on their guard. I remember one of the hardest things for me when I'd get people would want a, a job recommendation and, and uh, that our, our separation hadn't have been on the best of circumstances. And uh, as a consequence, I had to write something saying uh, to speak the truth, but not to... Um, tell them all the truth because our lawyer told me you better be careful you can get sued so I basically have to say well you know I I ended up filling these out saying I would recommend that you hire them to any position for which you believe they are qualified and that was my answer it was a non-answer because I didn't want to say I can hardly recommend this person for this position now there were certain people I could do that because they were just great people. But some people had some character flaws, and, and even in the church, that can come out. And you don't want to put that negativity on somebody else and make them have to deal with it. But at the same time, do there's a slander means that you're intentionally going around. It's kind of engaging in a triangulation where person A is talking to person B about person C, and the whole purpose of the conversation is to get person B to like person A better than they like person C. And, you know, then they're talking to, person A is talking to person C, and they talk about person B, and they'll diminish person B in the eyes of person C because they want the person C to like them better than they do person B. The idea is that there are certain people who have this kind of uh, narcissistic be way of behaving where they have to be the center of everything. They have to be the hero. They have to be the most wonderful person. That's why in some ways when you have a problem, they'll be the first ones to rush in and say, oh, I love you. I care about you. What can I do to help you? But you'll find that they'll tire of that over time and then they're not so helpful. And the reality is then they'll begin to, if you begin to get close to somebody else, they'll begin to talk to you about how terrible that person is because they'll always want to redirect your attention, your focus, and your admiration to them. Now, I don't have time to go into all the complexities of narcissistic personality disorders because all of us separate, suffer from that to some degree. 
But you catch yourself when you find yourself speaking about another person. If you feel it's necessary to explain some of the negative sides of a person's personality or character to somebody who needs to know that, then that's okay. You need to warn people about that and saying, you know, uh, this is probably somebody you don't want to date. But at the same time, if you're just saying it to make conversation, and if you're saying it just to make yourself look better, then that's slanderous. And that's something that uh, you should repent of and recognize is a being sinful. So it's in a very real sense, when we talk about, especially yesterday about politics, if I talk about the, the pre- present or current resident of the White House, that um, he is, he's a gentleman that I've followed his career uh, ever since the first time he ran for president back in, I believe it was 1988. And he had to step down from running for presidency because he was caught on various occasions stealing other people's speeches and delivering them as if they were own. One was a British politician by the name of Neil Kinnock. Another one was uh, Robert Kennedy. Um, and... <laughs> verbatim almost. And he would just had a reputation of being a man who would tell these fantastic stories, but they often true, proved to not be true, couldn't be verifiable. Um, he sided against civil rights. I mean, he was, he didn't, he, he literally said that uh, he wanted to keep segregation because he didn't want the schools becoming racial jungles. I mean, this is a guy who's had a whole history of saying things that are pretty wrong. And, uh, And so to tell people that and saying, this is who he is, and to point that out is not slander. It's actually saying you shouldn't cast your vote for a person like this because they're not a person of good character. And that's the difference. I mean, there are commercials that come on that were just pure made up garbage about politicians. And we need to recognize that. But that means we take the time to know the truth about who they are. And that's why we have a resident in the White House today who has not only significantly, severely diminished in his capacities, but he's also been a guy who's been challenged. He's basically what we call a pathological liar and may very well even be guilty of criminal activity. So that's not slander. That's just simply stating the facts because it matters because of the power and the importance that person has. Nor should you be willing to pretend that whoever you support for that office doesn't have their own set of issues. And that's one of the things I find that overlooking certain narcissistic behaviors that are kind of obvious um, is something also you need to be forewarned from. Because again, what people are doing is they're putting their trust in a politician. Do I think that one is better than the other? Well, just having somebody who has their minds and their wits about them has to be better than what we have. And whose policies did work effectively in the past is also something that's good. And who ostensibly has really done a lot to stop the abortion industry. All of those things to me are pluses, but I don't trust my, I don't put my trust in man. I put my trust in God. And so I pray God have mercy upon us and give us somebody who can deliver us from the reign of evil we're under right now, especially with a promotion of sexual immorality and abortion and the rest of this kind of chaos and confusion and violence and criminality. It's just, it's just wrong. It's obvious. That's not just simply being politics. That's po- policy. And it means that as Christians, we're to stand for that which is good and right and true. And if anybody, no matter who they are, violates those rules, we need to call that out. It doesn't matter whether they have a DR or independent in front of their name. We need to be able to speak the truth to those who are in power. And that's God's truth as given to us in his word. So the first thing he says is let's not slander anybody. And secondly, he says to be peaceable, that we should not be people who go out and create violent occasions and a violent events, that we don't burn things down, we don't cause violence, but rather we're looking for peaceful harmony. We're looking for open and honest discussion. We don't want to be yelling and screaming at the top of our lungs. That's why one of the things I love when you see the the, uh, pro-abortion rallies, they're raucous, they oftentimes break into all sorts of violence and outrage and all this sort of stuff. And then you look at a pro-life rally in Washington, D.C., and what do they do? They peacefully march through the streets, singing songs and and giving speeches about the right to life and doing it in a very sane and organized manner, not in chaos and confusion. That's a good biblical example of what we should be seeking to do when we go into the public square. And that's why he said that thirdly, you need to be considerate. You need to consider what is really um, in the best interests of other people. 
that I, you know, when I see somebody who is in the LGBT community, I'm not going to lie to them and pretend to them that it's okay, but I don't want to treat them with disrespect or dishonor. In fact, when he goes on to say to show true humility towards all men, that just because somebody is entangled in a sinful lifestyle doesn't mean that they're less than me. I can't begin to see myself as being better or more important than them. And that's the danger. We need to be considerate of them, to talk to them in a way that we hope they can hear us and understand what we're saying, and to do it with a kind of humility that basically says, I'm not condemning you because of the choices you've made. The Word of God condemns you, but I don't. I pray that you'll hear what God says, that you'll reach out to the Savior and let Him heal that incredible damage and brokenness that's going on in the inside of you. Because people who fall into these lifestyles are broken, damaged people who are desperate need, and they've basically reached in the wrong direction. They've sought for love in all the wrong places, and it's only going to lead to their death and destruction. So we need to be compassionate toward these people, praying for them, and not treating like they're subhuman or they're some kind of thing that got stuck on the bottom of our shoe, but rather to really reach out to them in love and compassion and realize that these are tormented, troubled people who need to know Jesus. Well, one more, we'll pick it up in chapter 3, or verse and verse 3 of chapter 3, where it kind of turns the, really explains to us why we need to be more humble in dealing with other people. More tomorrow.